speaker before tea is Arvi Vigdorsson of the Institute for Advanced Study, and he's going to speak on Kurt Girdle and computer science. Hi, okay, I uh, think we are challenging you very much uh, with the uh, content of, this, uh, of these lectures and I'm not going to make it easier at all. Uh, <laughs> I want to tell you about uh, Gedder's influence on uh, work in uh, computer science and uh, we are going to see a lot of different concepts here in, the, in this talk. So with uh, some of them you've seen, of course, uh, notions of proof and truth, uh, notion of computation, which is of course essential to what I'll talk about, uh, Turing's work, the notion of efficient computation, which will be the sort of center uh, deviating from all the previous talks here to uh, focus on more current work uh, in computer science and actually work that uh, Gödel foresaw in his letter that was recently discovered to von Neumann in 56, just half a century ago. Uh, and that talks about the p versus np problem, which I'll try to explain to you and explain also why it's so important to science in general. Uh, what it says about the limits of knowledge that's, uh, I think, more concrete and uh, than, than Gedder's original uh, incompleteness theorem. And uh, at the end, I'll go back to completely different types of proof systems that uh, we play with nowadays in, uh, uh, in computer science. So this is a material for a semester long course, so I'll obviously <laughs> oversimplify cheat and uh, use other means. Uh, so let me start. Uh, it was uh, nice that uh, Professor Pfefferman did for me the uh, slow introduction to logic there, so here it's all on one slide, what is a proof and a proof system. There are two basic ingredients, axioms, which are self-evident statements, and deduction rules by which we infer new uh, statements from old ones. And then the proof of uh, some mathematical statement is just a sequence of statements where the initial ones are among our axioms, and then we deduce subsequent ones using the application of some deduction rule. What is important that Professor Pfefferman stressed is that verification is a simple and mechanical procedure. This is true of all proof systems in mathematics. And once you have that, then it's clear that if you believe the axiom then, and the soundness of deduction rules, then you should believe uh, the theorem. That's a proof. Uh, this is a, an extremely old concept and uh, Probably the best uh, treatment is uh, Euclid's elements, uh, the oldest treatment in which this deductive uh, uh, mathematics is explained, and it's been done like that in the several thousand years since. Uh, a new concept, uh, certainly a century old, not much more, uh, is that of computation. Uh, it's, of course, much, much older than that, but its formalization is new. But uh, notice that it looks very similar. Uh, it has two ingredients. One is inputs, which is uh, available data. This can be numbers or bits or uh, contents of data like this, atomic content. And uh, then you have operations which are simple and local that allows you to combine. Uh, you can take logical uh, composition or you can add two numbers, something uh, basic like that. These are operations. And our computation, again, uh, of some function f uh, is again a sequence, in this case a sequence of data items, of numbers say, x1, x2 and so on, where now the initial uh, brown ones are the inputs on which you want to evaluate your function and then subsequent values are just computed from all the ones you already have using ba a basic operation. So. 
syntactically it looks very, uh, very similar to proofs and should look uh, very similar. It is similar, but there are some differences that I want to stress. Uh, one essential difference is that a computation should be described. This is, uh, you know, Turing's uh, discovery and definition. Uh, computation should be de described by a finite algorithm, by a finite program that tells you which rules you are supposed to apply at every step of the way in order to compute your uh, computer function. Uh, for proofs, everybody who's a mathematician or thinks about mathematics realizes that, uh, you know, we don't have the specification of what to do next when we are thinking about uh, proving a theorem. So that's a major uh, difference. And this finite program, this algorithm, when it tries to compute a function, should work always and terminate always in finite time. Okay, so that's one difference. Another difference that uh, sometimes is ignored, but uh, somehow cannot, should not be ignored, cannot be ignored, is that computation, unlike proof, is really all around us. And uh, if you really abstract away the, the uh, definition of computation, you realize it's simply the evolution of a, an environment uh, via the repeated application of simple local rules. And uh, if you think about anything in physics or biology or chemistry or, you know, just uh, anything, any environment uh, and any physical process uh, that you might have, you realize that it applies uh, to all of them. Uh, nature basically computes itself every second of the day using, you know, its own rules, the laws of physics and others. So it should be clear because of that that understanding algorithms, in particular al algorithms that are in nature, like the algorithms of our brains or the algorithms of, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, immune system, are extremely uh, important for us. So that's another difference from proofs, but I want to get back to the common grounds between proofs and computation that are very important for what comes next, is the uh, fact that, as we saw, in both of them, progress is made by uh, simple local rules. And in both of them, uh, so maybe a further common point is that in both of them there, are these, uh, there is this bad news. We, we just uh, can't know everything we want to know. So in logic, in proof systems, that's uh, what Professor Pfefferman talked about, and uh, we want to know whether that's one of the things that he called an exaggeration, actually, but I'll put it in this form. Uh, a basic question is, can we know everything which is true? Uh, can we prove everything with it, which is true? And Geddes in Completeness Theorem states that, no, there are some true statements that can never be known. And you saw some examples. Uh, in computation, it turns out that uh, we have the same phenomena, and we can ask, I mean, the basic question there is, can every function uh, be computed by a finite algorithm? And during the important work that was very, very influenced by Geddes' work, uh, it's called the Undecidability Theorem, a few years afterwards, says, uh, again, bad news, some functions are not computable, they are undecidable in its language. And just to show you how close the, the two uh, concepts are of proof and computation, let me show you how to prove Turing's result from Geddes' result. Okay, here's one line. Define the following function. Uh, I'm not being too formal, of course, but uh, the function operates on, on mathematical statements, but as Professor Pfefferman told you, mathematical statements can be encoded as numbers. So define the following function. The function of statement is one. If the statement is true, it's a zero if it's false. Now, it's very easy to see that a program which solves this problem, finite program, is a complete and consistent uh, proof system. So by Gether theorem, that cannot be. So you see how close these uh, two notions are. What does it say? So we heard from several speakers. Uh, uh, what does it say about what we can know in mathematics? So uh, it was pointed out, of course, that the original examples of things we cannot access 
were not very natural, like, uh, like Gedel's sentence, uh, or even the consistency of piano arithmetic is not something that mathematicians are, are uh, normally working on. But here are some examples of thing, things that mathemati math mathematicians and computer scientists are working on daily. Uh, they want to know whether uh, some equation has a solution. They want to know whether a, logical, a given logical system is, uh, statement is provable. Programmers around the world write code and they want to know that there are no bugs, you know. Uh, in their programs. And not only the, are these general problems uh, difficult, even specific instances of them are difficult. So, you know, you recognize this as a special case of Fermat's last theorem. Even this special case took a century to prove uh, that there are no integer solutions here. And you know that it took two more centuries for Wiles to actually resolve the general case with any exponent there. Uh, this the um, uh, escape me. Well, logicians should help me with the uh, name of this uh, axiom of choice. Okay, axiom of choice uh, that uh, mathematicians argued about all the previous century. By now, it's accepted, but it's not provable from the standard axioms. So this was also a difficult case. And here, I, I just wrote a really simple program that any programmer could have written. In, it's very short. And uh, you ask whether it's bug-free. Well, let's ask whether it terminates for every input. That's the basic question about bugs. You don't want your program to run forever. You get an integer. If it's one, you stop. If it's even, you half it. If it's odd, you multiply by three and add one. So I ask you, does it ever terminate? Does it terminate for every input? Well, many of you, I'm sure, uh, recognize this problem. It's still open. Nobody knows. It's a very, uh, well, it's, it's, there, are, there are good reasons to think about this, uh, uh, but I will not get into them. And uh, just to point out that even specific instances of these very natural questions in mathematics are open. Certainly, in general, uh, it was proven for all of them and for many other natural classes of questions that mathematicians do study that they are undecidable in uh, Gödel and Turing sense. There are no. Uh, there's no computer program that will solve all instances of this type of problem. So these are some of these things that we cannot know in general. Okay. But of course, you know, after Gödel, also before, but strongly after Gödel, people set out to see what kind of general statements are provable. And uh, they did good. And there are many, many examples where there are. Uh, you know, so for example, you can ask whether a given equation has solution in the real numbers instead of the integers. That turns out to be easier. For that, there is a decision procedure. You can ask whether uh, a given knot that you can describe easily, uh, whether it, you know, it pulls out to, to be unknotted or not. And uh, uh, it turns out this is a very difficult theorem. Whether it, uh, it has an algorithm took many years, but uh, you know, it was done. So these are decidable. They are solvable in Gödel's sense. And uh, there is a general procedure to answer all such questions. So there is a single computer program that will tell you for every knot, for example, in finite time whether it's presented or not. So the main question is now, should we, uh, are we done? I mean, so the undecidable, we have no chance of getting to. That's out of the question in general. These guys are supposed to be the good news. So are we happy that these are things we can know, we can understand mathematically? And one concrete way to study it is uh, turn the clock. And uh, well, finite time is a long time. When, <laughs> when will we know? And this brings me to, uh, to the more uh, modern view, which actually, as we discovered, was started by Gödel. Uh, not talking about efficient computation, uh, not talking about computation in general, but making it, you know, tractable, something that we can access in our lifetime. Okay, so let me start by an example of a computational problem, which is certainly decidable. Okay, this is a problem that's very dear to mathematicians' hearts. This is the problem of proving theorems. So. The input here is a mathematical statement that we'd like to prove, like the Riemann hypothesis, and some number n, which is supposed to be an upper bound on the length of the paper we are going to write, okay? <laughs> on the, which, 
I think most mathematicians don't set it out to themselves in advance, but I think they all know that there is such a small number, like a hundred, or uh, for most it's even shorter, right? So, uh, so given such a you know a pair, is there a proof of length n? That's the basic question. But well, here's one algorithm. Why don't we try all of them? All various sequences of length n. We saw what the proof is, so it's a uh, you know, it's just a sequence of words, of letters. And moreover, we saw that verifying whether something is a proof is trivial is a mechanical thing that uh, we can do quickly. So this algorithm certainly finite terminates in finite time. So what's the problem with it? Now, the problem is that it's complex. It takes too long. I mean, even if n is small, 2 to the n, the complexity, the number of steps, the number of possibilities you have to run through is enormous. Okay, if n is 100 or 200, you'll just never end. And uh, typically, you know, in, in logical symbols, this n will be, I mean, 100 pages have uh, many bits in them. So it's terribly inefficient. So even though the problem is decidable, I don't think we can say that we know, we understand uh, this. And indeed, the very fact that mathematicians work hard still at uh, proving theorems means that we don't understand it. Now, what was Gödel's question? Gödel f saw this. It's, it's like the philosophy papers. It's unknown, but uh, it was discovered uh, about 15 years ago that Gödel wrote a letter to von Neumann. Von Neumann was already dying of cancer. There was never a response, uh, in which he raises exactly this problem, and in which he asks specifically, in his words, in his language, is there an efficient algorithm for this problem? Is there an algorithm that rather than like a monkey trying to type out war and peace in all possible ways here, uh, you, know, will, you know, is there a clever way that will cut through this exhaustive search and get us to the solution in efficiently, in his uh, words, n or n squared steps? Something that's not much bigger than the data. Something that grows slow with the size of the data. Okay? And that's what we take to be the uh, definition of efficient computation here. And it turns out that he foresaw these developments of the late 60s and early 70s in computer science, which asked exactly this question and then went far beyond that. I'll tell you some things about this, uh, this question. But let me tell you uh, these definitions of P and NP, which we'll repeat in the next few slides so you don't have to remember them. Uh, NP is a class of problems for which verification of a solution is quick, is efficient. So, for example, for this kind of problem, proving theorem, if you are presented with a solution, with a proof that takes n pages, then verifying it is easy. So this problem is in the class NP. P, this, stands, this P stands for polynomial, and this stands for non-deterministic polynomial, which comes from the ability to guess the solution. So P polynomial, like n or n squared or n cubed, etc., cetera, uh, are problems for which there is a, an efficient algorithm of this complexity that finds a solution. Okay? And we just saw that, uh, you know, and I'm sure Gödel realized this, uh, this problem, for example, is in NP, verification is trivial, uh, can we find solutions efficiently? That was Gödel's question. And okay, here are the definitions again. I want to tell you, to show you another example. So we saw one example of a problem in NP, and which we don't know if it's in P or not. And I want to show you another example. Here's another, just to get some intuition about these uh, classes, which are. I'm sure if some of you see for the first time. So it's a, a more, a even more natural problem to uh, people because it's something you learn in elementary school. Uh, it's the problem of factoring integers. The input is an integer, x, and you are supposed to find its prime decomposition. So for example, in this case, the primes are 23 and 37. When you multiply them, you get 1541. So where is this problem? Uh, 
what do we know now? So the current best algorithm, and this is the problem that people are working on, the last 30 years have seen enormous uh, investment of uh, effort to give a good algorithm to factor integers. We'll talk about reasons later. But the best known algorithm runs in time, which is something like exponential in square root n, if n is the number of digits in the number x. So this is still terribly inefficient if you know, x is, uh, n is 200 digits, then it's hopeless. And if it's 300, I think uh, the sun will burn before the best computers will uh, burn out, I mean, <laughs> before the best computers will, uh, will factor such long integers. So it's just the current best we know is just too complex. On the other hand, it's clearly in NP. I mean, if I gave you the factors, all you'll have to do is multiply them out and see that it gives you the right number. So this is a, you know, easy to verify a solution when given. So it's a problem in NP. But is it in P? Does it have an efficient algorithm? We don't know. And we also mentioned the same statement uh, about theorem proving. So we don't know this and we don't know that. But we do know something. So let me, and this is uh, really important, this is what we know. We know that if you have an efficient algorithm for this problem, then you have an efficient algorithm for the second problem. And this is, I mean, for those people here who see it for the first time, it's pretty remarkable because the, these two problems seem to have nothing to do with each other. One talks about logical systems, and the other talks about just factoring integers and what, uh, what can the relation be. And uh, I want to tell you about the relation because it sort of uh, explains more why, why these classes and why this uh, P versus NP question is, is so important. And the reason, uh, which I'll not prove, I'll just state uh, and explain, is that theorem proving is not just any problem. It's a very important problem. It's a kind of universal problem. This universality we'll call NP complete. So let me define what this term means for it. What is this NP completeness? So a problem, any problem like the ones we've seen before, uh, we call it NP complete if it is in some sense the hardest in this class of problems that have easy verification. And more formally, if this problem, it somehow carries all the hardness of the class on its own shoulders. If this problem finds an efficient algorithm, if we find an efficient algorithm for it, then all problems in NP are easy. All of them. So it's universal. Okay, now this is a definition. Uh, and okay, usually when you have a definition in mathematics, you have to show that there is a, at least one, <laughs> one <laughs> example that uh, you know, satisfies it. And uh, in fact, I stated one in the previous slide. I said that there is. The theorem proving is such a complete problem. So if you can do it efficiently, then you can do everything. Factoring is just an example. Everything. Uh, in NP, and we'll soon talk about what is, you know, what the extent of everything there is, but uh, then you start wondering, you know, how unique is this problem that it's complete, that it's universal? Is it very esoteric property? You know, are there many problems like this? Are there, you know, is it one or two or what? What are these complete uh, universal problems? And that's another thing that uh, was discovered uh, Starting in the 70s, by this, uh, starting with uh, Cook and Karp and, and Levin, and then a flow of work in the 70s and 80s, that uh, and it's still continuing today because other sciences are discovering this uh, concept and uh, looking at their problems. There are, you know, many, many hundreds, thousands of, of problems in all of uh, uh, mathematics and science which are NP complete. They are just like. Just like theorem proving, they are all of exactly the same complexity. Okay, if you have found an efficient algorithm to solve one, you have found an efficient algorithm to solve all of them, even though they definitely seem like they have nothing to do with each other. So I just wrote, you know, just a few just to pick your uh, imagination. So in mathematics, we talked about this kind of problems, proving theorems or unknotting knots, which even they don't seem to have anything to do with with each other, but they are uh, both equally hard because they are NP complete. And in computer science, there are numerous optimization problems that have to do. Well, these are just examples again. But also in physics, these are problems in statistical physics about computing energy, 
uh, of various uh, statistical models. Even uh, my friends here in string theory probably know that there are some papers showing that uh, like computing which vacua in string theory are uh, you know, consistent with the current value for the cosmological constant is an NP-complete problem. Uh, and in biology, there are many of them because they are with, with uh, you know, advances in, in biology, in uh, bioinformatics, and the genome projects, and so on. There are many algorithmic questions asked in biology, and uh, they uh, they give rise to to problems which are NP complete. So, uh, what does it say? We said that uh, well, now 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 it seems sort of uh, frightening in the sense that uh, well. If the best algorithm for these are is the best algorithm that we saw for factoring or for uh, proving theorems exponential, that we can never know these things. And I think that's the right interpretation. We can never know them in general. Uh, of course, in many, many practical instances, uh, when you realize this, you, you, well, you specialize your problem or you uh, settle for an approximation of your understanding or you go for heuristics. And, there are many practical ways to try to deal with this difficulty, but the, this difficulty is there. Okay, so it's a, it's a universal, ubiquitous uh, concept. This, uh, it's, it's actually, I think, quite unique in science that there is a concept which spreads and, uh, across all sciences and, in fact, uh, satisfies this, uh, you know, satisfies some statement, meaningful statement, talking about all of them, showing that all of them are equivalent in a precise mathematical sense. Uh, so it brings us again to the uh, question we talked about before, what is the limit of knowledge? And now I want to make some uh, bold statement, maybe raising controversy for the panel discussion, uh, interpreting these two uh, classes. So P, I want to say, so we said what, what it is, it's problems whose solution, solution we can compute efficiently. So basically, if you want to think of it in uh, everyday terms, this is just everything we can really know, know in our lifetime, know efficiently. Whereas NP captures almost everything we want to know. Well, let me sort of justify it, okay? Why, are we, why is everything we want to know, things we want to, things we can, those solutions we recognize? Well, being very childish, let me, let me put here uh, examples of questions, uh, you know, uh, creative people are, are thinking about, uh, you know, for mathematicians it's uh, trying to find proofs of theorems, for scientists maybe it's, uh, you know, trying to find a model or a theory that explains, uh, you know, data, like maybe this, you know, explains uh, the universe uh, or, or explains some, some particular biological system. And, uh, and, well, engineers, of course, have plenty of problems like that. Uh, I want to s claim uh, that in most of these problems that we humans raise, we have some criteria to recognize that we've gotten there, to recognize that we are done, to recognize that we can manufacture the product, or to recognize that we can write a paper and show it to our colleagues. And this is what puts it in NP. So now the P versus NP question, you know, the question whether all these, you know, problems have efficient solutions. Well, if they do, well, the, you know, a simple computer program can replace, uh, well, we'll have to look for another job. So uh, that's also the reason most people believe that P is different than NP because there are all these problems out there, like the problems of the previous slide, that, uh, you know, people have been trying to find efficient solutions for decades and had good interest, in, uh, huge interest in solving them and couldn't. So most people believe that, indeed, some of these problems are just, just don't have efficient solutions. For some of them, exhaustive search is the best, the best we can do. And this brings me to the last part of my uh, talk, which is, uh, okay, well, if P is different than NP, then what? Is it only bad news? Is, uh, well, I mean, I don't know if it's bad news that we scientists have to just continue doing our work and have fun with it. Uh, it doesn't sound so bad, but, uh, I mean, certainly it puts limits to, to knowledge or to effectively, uh, to, to knowledge that we can effectively reach. Uh, 
but is it all bad if p is different than np? So here are some good news. In fact, good news you, you all know about, but I'll tell you about anyway. Maybe you don't know that you know about them. Uh, uh, there's a famous uh, paper of Eugene Wigner that's often quoted in which the title is the unreasonable, unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the sciences, which is, uh, uh, you know, beautiful and uh, uh, provoking uh, paper. Uh, so I want to put something else unreasonable here, and this is the unreasonable effectiveness of difficulty, of hardness. So we saw that we have these problems which are probably hard, you know. What can we, can we do anything with them? Well, it turns out we can do a lot, and that's the modern uh, science of cryptography within theoretical computer science. And uh, let me, ma so let me postulate something stronger than P different than NP. I'm, uh, I will assume for the rest of the, of the lecture that actually not only are these NP complete uh, problems difficult, but even integer factoring for which we don't know whether it's complete or not. I mean, just the problem out there in, in NP. Uh, let me uh, assume that it has no efficient algorithm, that the best solution is some exponential, uh, exponential algorithm for this problem. So how can this be useful? What can you do with it? Well, here's what you can do with it. You can you can have all of cryptography, namely secure and private digital protocols, protocols, you know, uh, means of achieving them completely digitally with, with computers, with no physical means, for huge number of tasks that, uh, you know, it's just a, a small partial list. So, uh, secret communication, let me read them, contract signing, electronic cash, playing poker on the phone, uh, digital signatures, uh, distributed coin flipping, zero knowledge proofs, I'll talk about that. All of e-commerce uh, that, that we are experiencing, in fact, the very, the very fact that the internet developed the way it is and uh, for, for uh, you know, uh, the ability of people to really uh, securely communicate over the internet uh, is due to this assumption. So you all here in this uh, room and all of you outside there are assuming, are betting that uh, integer factoring is hard. Uh, I want to uh, uh, stress this, so just talk briefly about two of these examples and uh, making sure you, you realize that you trust this mathematical assumption, the difficulty of some problem that you never cared about. Uh, for your, well, at least for your money. Uh, certainly for your privacy. Okay, so uh, here's the first magic. It's called public key encryption. And that was the first uh, realization initially by Diffie and Hellman. I'll tell you more of the power of uh, having hard problems. So here are three people, and let's imagine that they only met now. Okay, they just uh, met each other for the first time just now. Well, it is possible, even though they don't know each other and have no prior information, any pair of them, Alice and Bob can start a secret conversation in the presence of Eve without her understanding uh, a single word. So right now I can start with uh, Peter Goddard, one I never met, of course. And we can start now a secret conversation in the presence of all of you and nobody will understand. If you don't recognize this, Think about the first time you bought something from Amazon. You gave them your credit card number. Well, you, I, I guess you never met them before. And uh, you, you somehow send them your credit card number. You suddenly type it in and you assume it gets to the other side because you see it charged in your bill, right? But you trust that nobody else who listens on the line can understand it. Well, this is exactly this scenario. Exactly this. You manage, you, what, what happens actually is a protocol which creates a secret language between you and Amazon that nobody else who's listening all the time can figure out. So that's exactly what happens, and this can be done. And that's the famous RSA protocol, and uh, it's the mathematical treatment by Goldwasser and Michali. So that's one magic that you can do with a hard function, with factoring. 
Here's another magic. Uh, this is, I mean, the, this uh, motivating story is a joke, but uh, uh, the, the content is very real. So here the motivating story is that uh, they are both mathematicians. Uh, one, let's say, is a chairman, and the other is a junior mathematician who just proved the Riemann hypothesis, which you just heard about. It's a very important problem. It's a million dollar problem, so actually you want to solve it. By the way, the P versus NP is another of these uh, million dollar problems on the clay list. Uh, so, well, she just did it. She wants, uh, you know, to get credit, to get uh, rich, and to get tenure. So she <laughs> wants to uh, <laughs> tell the chairman, but, uh, you know, she, you know, there's one worry, right? I mean, uh, maybe he'll take it and publish it first. So here's something magical you can do if factoring is difficult. Alice can convince Bob, beyond any reasonable doubt, that her proof is valid without giving him a single hint of anything, except this fact that the proof is valid, that her proof is good. There's a, that's what's called the zero-knowledge proof. And in fact, there's nothing special about the Riemann hypothesis. Every possible theorem for which you have a proof can be converted efficiently into a zero-knowledge proof. So this can be done for any kind of statement, and it's very significant in cryptographic protocol in which people have to prove to other people that they are doing what they should without revealing their secrets. So it's a very fundamental building block. Let me end with some conclusions and uh, open problems, and uh, well, what have we seen? Part of parts of what we've seen, uh, definitely we've seen the similarities uh, uh, between proofs and computation, and how important they are. In fact, I should may maybe state that the fact that the reason that every proof can be made zero knowledge uh, stems from the connection between proofs and computation and the problem of theorem proving being NP-complete. Uh, efficient computation, what can be done in reasonable time, is a fundamental problem not only of computer science, but of science. And the, the you know, sad fact still is that we just don't know how to argue hardness. I mean, we just don't know how to answer this kind of question. We don't know how to prove that integer factoring is hard. So right now, we trust it for electronic commerce, but you just have to imagine what a catastrophe to economy it will be if tomorrow somebody finds an N-squared algorithm for factoring. It, it seriously will be a, uh, a, a significant event, and uh, we should work on finding, on resting cryptography on, on solid, more solid grounds. Actually, it will be a great. Uh, it's a great challenge to rest cryptography on the, f on the hypothesis that P is different than NP. That's a much more solid uh, assumption. And, well, Gedel's question, is P equal to NP? And as I, I think I've argued to some extent, it just captures the question of whether creativity of all these scientists, engineers, mathematicians can be automated, can become, can be solved by simple, efficient computer problem. Thank you.